Um, but I'm excited about this uh, this day and excited about what God is doing. Amen. And so, as you guys see on the board, what kind of witness of Jesus are you? I really thank God for the way he set this up because today is evangelist, uh, evangelism day. Amen. Can we give it up for that? Right? The privilege of being able to go tell somebody about the somebody that saved us and the somebody that's still saving all type of people all over the world. The blood is still wet to forgive sins. Amen. The blood of the lamb. And today would be the final uh, lesson on what kind of witness of Jesus are you. Then we get to go out and share these messages, the tools that we learn in these last or these three messages with the world. Amen. We get to be able to differentiate between who is who out there and minister in love and in grace to these individuals to let them know what the truth of the matter is. Amen. What kind of witness of Jesus are you? Amen. And so I'm so excited about that. Um, last week we talked about we went through the last uh, two weeks, we went through the three different kind of witnesses that Mark explains within his gospel. And today we're going to be doing the fourth one. What kind of witness of Jesus are you? The Bible says in Mark chapter 14, he says this. Let me just get this open. The word of God says they took Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a what? At a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat down with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him. But their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave the, this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. Hallelujah for that. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the sovereignty of it, God. The perfection of it, God. You put it together, Lord God, in such perfection, God, that it is alive and active, God. It is the word, Lord God, of God, and we thank you for it, God. I pray today, Lord God, and thank you for the privilege of being able to preach your word and, and spread as a herald to the people, Lord God, what thus says the Lord. I ask God for wisdom and knowledge. I ask, Lord God, for uh, revelation and the insight of your word. Holy Spirit, may you give me the words to say in this very hour. And I pray, Lord God, for those who hear that your word would accomplish what it's sent out to do and not come back void. Lord, may we ask all ourselves, what kind of witness are we of you? And may we all, Lord God, be honest and be ready to turn to you, to be all that you have called us to be, especially in this day and age. Lord, we thank you and we praise you, God. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen and amen. Can we give it up for Jesus Christ, for his word? Hallelujah. The premise of the word witness and this sermon uh, thought, if you will, the ideal of it uh, really stems from the definitions that are utilized in these scriptures. And the one thing that you begin to see countless times uh, throughout this section of scripture in Mark is the word testimony or testify. And testimony is defined as a solemn declaration usually made orally by a witness under oath in response to interrogation by a lawyer or authorized public official. It is synonymous with witness, defined as 
an, a, an attestation of a fact or event. Testimony. Anybody got a testimony in the house? Hallelujah. Some of us are going through things, going through testing, and we want to get out of it, but we don't realize that without the test, we won't have a testimony. Amen? And so don't be so quick to get out of it, but be quick to pray and say, God, what are you trying to teach me so that when I do get out of this and make it to the other side, I can have a testimony that tells of the goodness of God. Amen? And so we need to, we need to make sure that we're operating in the testimony that God is doing in our lives. It is to testify to, to attest, to affirm to be true or genuine specifically, to authenticate by signing as a witness, uh, letter B, to authenticate officially, to be proof of. And then we have manifest. We're about to go out here this afternoon and evangelize to a community that are filled with different kind of quote-unquote Christian witnesses. And some of them, if not all of them, are going to fa fall into one of the four categories that we've been talking about in the last three weeks. But the main thing is this. We're going to go out there and we're going to testify. We're going to witness. We're going to give our testimony. We are going to attest or to affirm to be true or genuine. Specifically, we are going to be out there authenticating by signing, in a sense, our name as God signed it in the book of life to be a witness for Jesus. We're going to be out there authenticating officially and to prove that the word of God is true. Amen? That it is the unadulterated word. It is the word without errancy. It is the inspired God-breathed word. But see, it's one thing to testify with our mouths. It's a whole other thing to put actions behind those words that begin to manifest, as the word says here, readily perceived by the senses and especially by the sense of sight. That people should be able, through our testimony, through our testation, through our witness, the very passion, the authenticity, should be able to come out, not just in our words, but in our actions. When we begin to testify of the Lord, an individual or humans can be able to tell if a person is telling the truth or not. And yes, we have some very good magicians out here. We have some very good tellers of story out here. But there's something about an individual's testimony and attestation about God that as we begin to speak it, power comes forth by the Spirit of God. An individual can feel and sense that something is different about this individual. I don't know him. I don't know her. I never met them. But what they're saying I can attest to it in my heart. It's true. I need that which they have inside of them. And that is what we want to go out there and do. But we don't want to stop there, though. We want to be able to manifest in a sense. We want to be able for, to have individuals to perceive by the senses, especially by the sense of sight, that what we are saying, we also live. That if those individuals may find us in an Aldi or a Target or in a park, or walking along, or wherever, that they bump into us, that they don't bump into us, and remember that we preach the word to them, but then begin to watch us live a opposite kind of word that we had first gave them when we first met them. Could you imagine the kind of testimony that they would have about us if they were to hear us say one thing, and then see us watch, and watch us live out a whole opposite thing? Amen? And so we want to be ready for these things. We want to make evident or certain by showing. Somebody say showing or displaying. Somebody say displaying. Through those things, living out that which we testify about in our words. It is a true testimony or a true testimony is a witness who not only verbalizes that which they claim to have witness, but examples such testimony and witness that they that are attested as true and genuine, perceived through manifestation, readily perceived by the senses, and especially, somebody say especially, the sense of sight or visual evidence that their testimony and their witness is true by the showing or displaying such witness or testimony. You know, there was a time years ago that I was in contact with an individual and I was watching them on Facebook. And it, I really thought like this person was like out there evangelizing, standing on the word of God. There was a transformation through Facebook. How many people know that we can create all kinds of identities on Facebook? 
I mean, you could be a high priest on Facebook. You could be the president of the United States. At least they'll, they'll run for you because they'll think, man, you really own business. You really know what you're talking about. And so on Facebook, it seems like, man, bro, they must have a beautiful marriage. They must have an awesome, you know what I mean, life in a sense of living for God, right? Man, I, I would love to bump into them. And then one day, I actually do that. I bump into this individual, and I don't think they recognized me at first or whatever happened, but they tried to sell me some weed, and, and it went from there. And it was just like, what in the world is this? On Facebook, man, you have scripture after scripture after scripture, pictures of you and your wife and, and all these things and songs about Jesus. And, man, it looked like, based on what i seen on Facebook, your verbiage, testimony that you guys are sold out to Jesus. And then you try to sell me some weed. I said, brother, come on, man. I'm a, I'm a Christian. It's the first thing I answered him. I'm a Christian, man. I don't smoke weed. God, I got I had some issues in my life. I'm not perfect, right? But I don't smoke weed. I don't get, I'm a Christian, man. You know what I mean? And so, you know, he tried to cover it up. He was high as a kite. And uh, right there and then, the testimony. Listen, it doesn't matter what you say. Right there and then, man, I can't trust you. No matter who it is, man, they see you on Facebook. And then they, when they meet you in a situation like that, it's like, come on, man. I can't, I can't believe anything you're saying now. And it, at that time, you can't be like, oh, man, you know, I'm struggling. Oh, man, you know, it's, it's just tough. There's no way to get out of that. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? I just tried to sell the pastor some weed. How do you get out of that? Right? Like, there's no way out of that. And so you can just see, and he was trying to, like, you know, boost himself up and things like that. But it was just over. In a matter of a dime, our testimony is gone, you know? And so there is a huge uh, differentiation between one testifying verbally and another testifying by their actions. Amen? We want to not stop short of a testimony that is verbal. We want to declare and manifest our testimony with actions that are behind the things that we are saying. Amen? It's not saying that we're going to be perfect, but it is saying when we fall, we get back up, we repent, we apologize, and we never make excuses for that kind of lifestyle or those kind of actions, right? And we cannot stay in a, in a position where, you know, God is still working on me. God is, it can, listen, there should be, the Bible talks about a glory to glory to glory. And why am I saying this? Because of this reason right here is not to discourage people, not even that brother if he ever listens to the sermon. It is to say this. We need to be careful because if we're carrying the flag, like outside of our church is that Christian flag, literally the Christian flag. If we're, we're all carrying spiritually this Christian flag, and the question is how you represent that flag is going to determine whether other people carry that flag with you. Amen? Somebody need to put that in their Facebook and in their Instagram instead of, the drunkenness and the stripping or whatever on your Facebook page. <laughs> Put that out there and say amen to that. Amen. And so we've been going the last uh, three weeks. We went through three different kind of uh, uh, witnesses of Jesus Christ. We talked about in the first one, in the first week, we talked about the reality of, let me get through this, the distant witness. And the distant witness can be uh, broken down to a state of an individual claiming to be a Christian, but only when other Christians are around. They are behind the scenes. They're not really following the Lord. They're not really standing and declaring the things of God. There is no line in the sand saying, I would not cross this line. I am a Christian. My flag is down. This is where I'm at. This is what I stand on, the word of the living God. A distant Christian is an individual who is incognito. He is in the shadows. I remember a time when I was working with, with some individuals and one of them claimed to be a Christian. He played the drums, things of that nature years and years ago. And, he, you know, in the mouth, he claimed to be a Christian. But what I come to realize that he was a distant witness because low key, he was going to strip joints. Low key, he was cheating on his wife. Low key, he was doing all these other things. 
and I'm sitting there and they knew I was a Christian. Granted, never declared to be a perfect Christian, but I'm standing there and he would say all these crazy things. But then when other Christians would come around inside this place of a business, right, his tone would change instantly. If they didn't know him, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm, a, I'm on the worship team, you know, I play the band. But what you realize is this individual is a distant Christian because when hot topics came up by these same individuals and even conversations as we have on the job, it was never a differentiation. It was always, hey, I'm not going to go through this. I'm not going to definitely be on trial. I don't want to debate about this. So therefore, as a distant witness, I am going to compromise and I'm okay with abortion. I'm okay with the agendas and the, and the hot topics of the day. And so what happens with a distant witness is they are on the, the sidelines by the fire with the world, comforted, safe, and warming themselves up as other Christians are on the front line laying down their lives for Jesus. And in this case, it was God himself who was on trial. And he was on trial about to be crucified. He was a capital murder case, if you will. And yet here is Peter on the sidelines, blaze, you know, right by the fire, just kind of looking. He wanted to be close enough so he can hear the word speak if he did, but never be close enough to stand on the word or with the word made flesh and say, I'm with him. Notice that. He was always at a distance in that time. He wanted to hear the word. He wanted to hear what was going to happen but never took the time to come and stand with the word and face that kind of capital case. It's a distant witness who ends up becoming no witness at all. Never, there was never at this time that Peter took the stand and say, I object. I'm a witness for the defense. Instead, he let whatever happened, happen, and he kept quiet. In fact, a distant witness would always lead to denying the Lord Jesus Christ when it truly mattered. And that is what Peter did. We had the first one, a distant witness. The next one we talked about was the contradicting witness. This one can be broken down in the sense of, as defined, to imply the opposite or denial of. An example is your actions contradict your words. The contradicting witnesses who stood up were witnesses who, were, who couldn't get their story straight. They would say one thing, but their lives exhibited another thing. They were contradicting witnesses. And see, I come to know inside the world that the enemy loves contradicting witnesses that call themselves Christians. Because every single time, he can make more contradicting witnesses out of that one contradicting witness. You see, we have to understand that in life, we're going to multiply ourselves. We're always going to be examples to other people. The question is, what kind of witness are you going to be to that individual? As Christians, we are either going to be a distant witness, a contradicting witness, or a legit witness of Jesus, and we will multiply, multiply those people. It is for that reason, you know, misery loves company. Because we're in misery, we are then creating other people who love misery, and we draw them to ourselves. When we become contradicting witnesses who one day I'm going to serve the God, oh, the Lord, I'm in there, I'm going to be obedient. But then the nighttime comes and I'm on this side and I'm doing everything opposite of what I did in the light. It is a contradicting witness. That individual that I seen in that gas station was a contradicting witness. He said on this thing on Facebook, but he lived an opposite life in real life outside of social media. They are a contradicting witness witness this verse in uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 24 in regards to contradicting witnesses talking to the Jews here Paul was as it is written God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you why because the Jews became contradicting witnesses they were teaching they were preaching they had the law they were supposed to be guides to the blind a light for those who are in the dark they were supposed to be the instructors of the foolish a teacher of little children, but instead what they became was contradicting witnesses. Jesus talked about and talked against these people more than anybody else. He probably even talked about them more than he talked about Satan or went against them. 
And he said, man, you put heavy burdens on other people, but you won't yourself will not lift a finger to apply the word of God to your lives. This is a contradicting witness where they stand and, and they know word, the word of God. They are very knowledgeable of scriptures. So we can know them. When we go out to evangelize or when you're out there and people claiming to be a Christian, you better recognize these kind of witnesses and what kind of witness you're dealing with. They could be a Jehovah witness. Come on, somebody. If you don't hear what they're saying and how they're living, right? But they are a contradicting witness. People who know the scripture. And I mean, they know that they've been around church culture and church life most of their lives. They can claim a lot of scriptures, put it all together. They could probably even preach and create good Bible studies, right? And sound very, very knowledgeable and eloquent in the word of God. But it's not until you see the life lived out that you will be able to determine what kind of witness that person is. So what do we have to do? We cannot stop short of what somebody says. We have to then sit back and be like, well, how do you live your life, though? How do you live? You got all the right answers. You know all the right scriptures, right? You got it down pat. You sound like you really had at a time probably a relationship with God, or at least you studied, you studied your behind off. Like, man, you really got into the word of God. But how are you living? Right? How are you carrying these things out. The Bible goes on and says in these verses, a person is not a Jew who is only who is one only outwardly, no circumcision, merely outward and physical. But he goes on to say it's internal. And when that genuine circumcised man or woman of God who's born again on the inside, you will begin to see those things on the outside. A contradicting witness. I want to move on to the next one. The third one that we talked about last week is the false witness. It is a, it is a wolf in sheep clothing, as you guys see the picture there. The false witness came from verse 57 on down. It says, then st- uh, some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands. And in three days, we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. They were false witnesses. They knew the word. Notice how they brought up some of the words of Jesus. Half of this was somewhat true. But every false teacher or false witness, we have to understand that there is a a good person, a good wolf in sheep clothing is a person who adds some truth and then mixes a lie with it. They are very successful false witnesses and teachers and prophets because they're mixing the two together. Amen? This individual comes up, or these individuals, the false witnesses come up. We heard him say, I would destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. There's some, a little bit of truth in there, but overall when you know the scriptures, you know, no, man, that's that's a twisting of the word. He didn't, he never said, I will destroy this temple. He says, no, if you destroy this temple, you see the twist there? In three days, I would rise it back up. And they say this. They said in three days, he will build another not made with hands. They done made up a whole other type of scripture and just started doing some Stephen 317 and just put it out there, mix it with some truth, shook it up in a bottle, and then poured it out to the people and said, here, drink some of this. Kool-Aid, and then, you know, people end up dying, Right? And so here it is, the false witnesses end up standing up, and they can be broken down very simple as individuals who speak the word but twist it for their own benefit. We have false teachers in the world who who teach and preach the word of God, but they twist it for their own gain. A lot of them are called the prosperity preachers. A lot of them simply just twist the word of God because they may not know the word of God or in order to evade, as we were talking about this morning, evade persecution, evade suffering, evade being counted in our world. They will twist the word of God and they will say things like, well, you know, we don't like to talk about those kind of things in our church. Well, you know, we don't like to judge people like that. We try to get to know people first. And then after that, we, you know, we go from there. And so what ends up happening is there's a twisting there. Instead of saying, hey, or they'll add even add, I know a lot of uh, uh, individuals would I'll put some names out there, Lecrae, Lauren Dago, uh, Hillsong, Pastor that had sat down, he's now standing up again, uh, uh, Joe Oshing and all these others who literally said, hey, we don't talk about these things, 
You know, I have family members who are homosexual. How dare I say they're in sin? How dare you not? How dare you not? And so we have to understand, right, so that we can avoid being a false witness. It doesn't matter if it's your granddaughter a daughter, or your grandmother or grandfather. If they're in sin, sin is sin. If they ask you a question, hey, so do you think that this is a sin? Well, yes, I do. Why do you think that? Well, because the word is black and white on it. It's sin. Right? And then all the other hot topics go all in that area. It doesn't matter whether it's my granddaughter that I'm telling, that's sin. Or my grandfather, that's sin. It's still sin. And so we have to understand that these questions are geared to making us false witnesses. And if we are not careful, we will easily fall under a false witness. Because we're speaking some of the word of God, but then we add our own twist to it. I know God says this, but you know, the culture is changing. So love is love, right? Some of the things that, that I heard people say. And so right there and then, you have now become a false witness. Whether it was to avoid or to evade whether it was to deflect or whatever it is, you have become a false witness. Rather than making it black or white, or for that matter, red and white, we made it a whole other color. And in that sense, you become a false witness. We grab the word and we begin to twist the word. I want us to understand that the word will never contradict itself. If you're standing on one verse, make sure that that verse is confirmed. Your interpretation of it is confirmed with another scripture. But if you're talking to somebody else, and I dealt with this a whole lot of times in my life where an individual will stand on one verse, and then as they're explaining that verse to me, they're saying, yeah, God is telling me X, Y, and Z, and they give me a verse, and then automatically, if I know, you know another verse pops up, and it's like, wait a minute, but if that is the interpretation you're giving on this verse, or out of context, whatever it is, and this verse over here says this, which goes against your whole understanding, brother, sister, I'm sorry, but you're deceived. Because you have now become a false witness, especially if you're spreading that stuff, but even to yourself, you're on the road to become a false witness because if you stand only on this and you miss this verse right here, and then this verse comes up and they tell you about this verse, like, you, you got to be, this cannot be God because God cannot contradict himself. We have an option. We have a choice to make. We're either going to stand on this or we're going to repent and say, man, well, I got to go back to the drawing board. What ends up happening with false teachers is they don't have to go back to the drawing board. They say, no, I just simply change God's word. I'll just simply change the application of, I'll change the context of it. Many pastors are doing that today. They're taking verses out of context, making it mean whatever they wanted to mean, and then they preach a sermon that sounds so good, it felt so good, it, it was so much motivation, but then you get a person who knows the word of God in context, and you're like, wait a minute, no, that don't even mean that. That's, that scripture does not mean none of that. What are some of those scriptures that we talked about last week? Philipp, the one in Philippians is a key one that people use. My wife has it on her shirt right now. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4, what is that? 13? 4, 13. That's the number one scripture that I've, as long as I've been a Christian that people take out of context. And they'll use it for all their glory. And then they'll spread it on Facebook. Y'all, y'all don't even understand, man. I got this young house, new house. Come on, somebody. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It does not mean that at all. Now, God does bless, us, bless people with homes and, you know, vehicles and things like that. Praise God. We're praying for a family, you know, today for that God will bless them with a new place and be able to go forward and provide for them. But it's not that God can do all things through Christ who strengthens No, they don't mean that. But I know my God can bless. My God owns everything. But I can, in context of that scripture, I can say, I know it's tough right now. But you can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength until he opens up that door and you walk in it. So what do I do for now? Well, God opens up a door, you minister to people. Right? Whatever situation you're in, let God use in that situation. But don't use the verse to get a house, but don't use the verse to step out of fear and go evangelize the gospel to somebody else. Somebody say amen to that. We're going to go out there and evangelize to people today. We can't say, God, I can do all things through Christ. I can get through this service and get home. But I'm not going to go to evangelism because at that time, God, can't, he doesn't give me. I'm afraid. 
I can't do all things, that thing, through Christ who strengthens me. But I can come to church and go home immediately afterwards and go play the PS5 or Xbox or whatever your prerogative is. This is how people use these texts out of context. This is false witnessing at its finest. Amen? You guys can catch that word on our YouTube or our, our, uh, our webpage, squadcc.org. Today I want to end with the true and faithful witness. The true and faithful witness. Here it is, Jesus in verse 60 on down gives us an example of how we ought to be. Praise God for his example of actions that speak louder than words. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. Blasphemy defined as an individual claiming to be God and is not. It is blasphemy. Blasphemy, according to the word of God and, and, and Jewish culture, is worthy of death. It is capital murder, uh, uh, capital murder kill on sight. Amen? So they accused Jesus of blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. At this point, the high priest became desperate. As you see him, as he stands up, what do you have to say for yourself? He wants Jesus to engage with him. We need to understand right here that the enemy wants us to engage with him. As long as we are silent, as long as we give no answer to the enemy, the enemy cannot engage with us. But it is the moment that we begin to respond to the enemy and engage with him that we begin to give him the power to deceive us. It was not until uh, Eve engaged with the serpent that she began to think contrary of the things of God and fell off in her testimony about God. It was not until she gave the enemy the time and the day with his lies that it began to cause her to think outside of the will and word of God, even to such a degree that Eve began to even twist God's word up that God had gave them. God says, listen, you can touch all these other trees in the field, all these other beautiful things. You can eat strawberries over here, apples over here. We got many kind of apples, whatever you want, ginger, whatever, all these little apples over here. So, uh, what is it? Uh, the different kind of apples, like the, the, the maple ones and all these other different kind of, variety of everything, right? Bananas, all this other stuff. But this tree right here with the canepas on it, you cannot touch this one lest you die. And the moment she started to engage with the enemy is the moment he began to twist her up and then she twisted God's word. Go back, read that for yourselves. And here it is, the enemy trying to engage with Jesus, not on a premise of truth, but on a premise of lies. Before Jesus gave his actual testimony, the high priest wanted Jesus to engage in the lies. Look at the word. What? He says this. Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remains silent. Why? He doesn't have to vindicate himself about no lies. He is the truth. I don't even have to speak in regards to these lies. They're lies. They're not going to stand against the truth. He is the truth. I don't even have to vindicate. I don't have to get myself out of it. I don't have to say nothing. I'm not even going to engage or give the opportunity for the enemy to start messing with those lies and start picking them apart or whatever it is or trying to justify myself. I'm the truth. I'm God. And so Jesus remains silent. Notice even in our lives, before we begin to operate in this kind of testimony that we talked about, in the last three weeks, 
is that we begin to engage with the lies of the enemy. Before we get to a point of evangelizing or the lack thereof or the fear of it, before we even get there or even to think about it, we are already engaged in a conversation that says, you know you suck. You ain't been reading enough this week. You haven't memorized enough verses. You know you can't go out there and evangelize. And before even Sunday comes to the evangelism day, we're already like, I got to break my leg or something. I need to trip over something, fall out the car. I need to do something right now. I need to think of something so I don't have to go because I can't. I'm not, I'm not ready. And then we ask the question, if we really want to get technical, we ask, who told you you weren't ready? 100% of the time, that was not God. It was the engagement of the enemy that brought lies, and the moment we started to engage with those lies is when the lies started to affect us. Amen? There was plenty of times when it came down to, like, uh, immorality, that before it happened, I engaged with the lies of the enemy in bed. Right? Yeah, you know, it's been a long time. Shouldn't have left you. Right? We start singing songs with it. We start thinking about all the stuff the enemy puts in our head, images, different kind of things, boom, boom, boom. It starts flooding in there, right? How many people know what I'm talking about? Maybe not this church, maybe the church of the street. And so we begin to deal with the lies that enemy injects in our head. And before you know it, we have compromised ourselves outside of the umbrella of God and into the reign of the enemy. And then we follow him. Jesus was not having none of it. Praise God. For the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He wasn't having it. Why? Because the Lord does not have to vindicate himself from lies and contradiction. He doesn't have to address the distant witnesses. He stands there as the truth and his actions already spoke louder than his words that brought him in front of Sanhedrin and now he's on trial for capital murder to be put to death and he doesn't say a word up until this point. He does not have to respond to lies or false witnesses and testimonies because he is the truth and the truth and faithful witness of both heaven and earth. He doesn't have to say anything because his life already proved everything. He doesn't have to respond to none of those things. It was not until Jesus noticed this. It was not until the Lord was asked a question about the truth. Not questions about the lies. It was only when they asked him a question about the truth. And they asked him this. Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? You see, the question now was shifted. And it left from the false witnesses, the distant witnesses, the contradicting witnesses. And now it was about Jesus and the truth. It was no longer about the lies. That now they gave Jesus... A question worth answering. A question worth engaging with. And Jesus knew that this would bring certain death upon him. But he also could not deny himself. And therefore, he could not deny the very cross in which he would bring, or in which it would bring, about the salvation to all those who would bring, who would believe, and even those who would bring false testimony and witnesses against the Lord. He knew the moment he would answer this question, he was guilty. He would be guilty. And even though, listen, not a guilt based upon the evidence of these false testimonies or the evidence of the the Sanhedrin, it was a guilt of the fact of this. He was God, but they refused to believe him. See, his response was truth. But because they were so bent on getting witnesses against him, they never allowed the Lord to have a defense, which again broke one of the laws of the Jewish culture. They were allowed to have a defense and even witnesses that could defend or come together to prove their defense. They didn't give Jesus any. Because the moment he claimed and answered that question in truth, they already found him guilty of blasphemy. Amen? And so here it is. Jesus responds with complete confidence. I am. I am. 
In Luke's account, Jesus is found telling the priests and the Sanhedrin this thing. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you would not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. You see, Jesus knew that they were not going to give him a defense. He knew, the moment I tell you who I am, you're not even going to believe me. And then if I even ask you who I am, you won't even answer me. Because many times they asked him, well, what about you? Answer me this. And remember, because they knew if they answered, it would only prove that God was right. So they stood silent. And they rather were embarrassed and take that embarrassment and that shame and being silent rather than be trumped. They stood silent. Many people, there's a reason for this. Jesus knew they would not believe in him. Even if he told them and answered their question when asked about his identity in essence. So many people, listen to the application of this. Many people are unable to be a true and faithful witness because so many refuse to believe what Jesus said about himself and what he proved by actions about who he is. Why? Why? We even know people today that do this very same thing. Why? Because people do not want to give up their own authority and rights over their own lives, their power, their will, their God complex, their position, their false perspectives, and ultimately their sin. They refuse it. God has proven it. God has showed up and showed out. You know there is no other. You know deep inside of you that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the Son of the living God, but we rather take the fence and keep on doubting in hopes, and this is straight, pure deception, in hopes that God would, quote-unquote, understand at that time came but, quote, unquote, we'll still understand why I keep choosing to sin. Why I keep choosing to sin? Because, man, sometimes I believe, is it even real? You ever heard people say that? We heard people say that even in this church. Right after they had binged in sin for a couple of weeks. And then when you ask them what was going on, man, I'm struggling. I'm just, I'm even wondering if God is even real. Is all this stuff real? Is it all for nothing? So, man, did you wonder that before you drink and got drunk or smoked weed or went out on a sex cafe? Like, did you ask those questions? Why didn't you call anybody up? No, it only comes because they're engaged with the enemy's lies. And when, the, when you engage with the enemy's lies, the only next thing after that is to become a witness that is opposite of the witness that Jesus Christ showed us to be. And so we stand on the fence with doubts. Well, sometimes I don't know. But if you pry just a little bit more, you will realize they're in complete sin. And the reason why they're doubting it's because they know they need to repent, but they don't want to because they love the world too much. This is real, real stuff. And yet we have Jesus, the true and faithful witness, showing us what it takes to be the proper witness, the faithful witness, the true witness. And it is one who turns around and repents and declares God as both Lord and Savior. They assume if I just remain on the fence with both faith and doubt, God would excuse me. And I can see, my, and I can ease, this is another thing, I can ease my guilty conscience in remaining in sin and rebelling against God, just as the high priest and the Sanhedrin did. You see, the high priest wouldn't answer that question because the high priest knew if they were wrong, I'm not giving up my power anyways. I'm not going to bow down and worship you anyways because I, I want my power. I want my prestige, and I want to continue in my propaganda. I am for self, not for God, even though I'm a representative of God. That was the Sanhedrin and the high priest. Yet Jesus makes, Jesus makes it clear, right? I am the Messiah, but not just the Messiah. We have to understand this. He asked two questions. Are you the Messiah and then the son of the blessed one? Look at the deception and hypocrisy. The reason why they use a blessed one, the word blessed one, was because they refused to use Yahweh or God out of reverence for God. They were so concerned with the, the real small, stupid stuff, right, religious stuff, so they became and continued in their religiosity, but only exposing that they never had a true relationship with God because standing before them was God in the flesh. And they were concerned about their verbiage 
rather than more concerned about the answer that Jesus was about to give them. And so he asked them, are you the Messiah, the Son, the Blessed One? Jesus' answer, the first one is, I am. We know that I am comes from the Old Testament in Exodus when Moses asked him, who should I say is sending me? And God responded and said, tell them that I am that I am sent you. Meaning when Jesus said I am, what he was saying is I'm God. I'm God. And so if he's God, mind you, the whole time the connection between Messiah being actually the son of God was not connected by the Jews. It was a Messiah who was not God, but one who would come and die for the sins of the people. And it was Jesus in, 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 gospel, in the Gospel of Mark that was trying to explain that the Messiah is God. Remember, he talks to them about David and David calling uh, uh, his God Lord and so forth. And he explains that whole thing. And he showed them, no, actually what it was was the Messiah is actually God in the flesh who would die for the sins of the world. Because only God can die for the sins of the world because only him is holy and perfect without blemish. And so the Son of God had to come down to earth to die for the sons of men and their sin because there will be no other man who was pure enough, unblemished, and perfect to die for the sins of man. It took God to become a man to die for a man. Amen? And so he says, I am. But he doesn't stop there in his answer. This is the scary part right here. He says, I am the son of God, God in the flesh. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. What he was telling them in retrospect was this. I'm not only the Messiah, but I'm God. And I'm not just some God. I am the God sitting at the right hand of God, the father in a position of judgment. And then he continues that statement. He says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. When you connect the coming in the clouds of heaven, it is a reference that talks about judgment. And what he was telling the people here who were judging him and he was on trial for is that, hey, from here on forward, you're going to see me sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And not only that, but you're going to see me come back in the clouds of heaven. And on that day, you're going to have to answer me. Whether you like it or not, you're going to give an answer of why you killed me. Do you understand the fear of just knowing that? That I'm about to kill somebody who just made such a declaration and his response is, I'm going to rise and I'm going to come back on the clouds of heaven and bring utter judgment upon you. And yet they disregarded it. And didn't even hear it. This reference comes from a reference from Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. In which all would have known the reference. Those Sanhedrin, the high priest, the Jews. What all would have known what Jesus just declared about himself. It was a reference indicating the coming of judgment upon the clouds of heaven. Jesus was declaring to them that one day they're going to have to face him. The high priest needed what he was looking for. And that from the very mouth of the Lord. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. They didn't even take the time to consider, is he right? Could he be? Is he? All the signs are there. Everything he's saying is, is it lined up in the word of God. We know it like the back of our hand, memorized. Could he be? They didn't even consider it. They just kept on with their agenda and their plot to kill Jesus, to remove him so they can continue in their propaganda. And see, many of us in this world are going to deal, and in this church, are going to deal with people in this world that have this same paradox where they don't even consider it because they're so blind by their own propaganda. They don't even consider, can Jesus be right? Can he really be the son of God? And if he is, and he comes back in the cloud of heaven, what side of the fence am I going to be on? Am I going to be one of those true and faithful witnesses? Or, I'm going to be, or am I going to be one of those distant witnesses? One of those contradicting witnesses? Or for that matter, one of those false witnesses? 
that Jesus would judge. We have an ultimate decision to make within our own lives in asking ourselves, what kind of witness are we going to be of Jesus? Is it going to be that distant one, the contradicting one, the false one? Or are we lining ourselves up with the word of God and Jesus, the word made flesh, the son of God, and become that true and faithful witness he exampled for us, even on this day when he gave the good confession? In Leviticus 21.10, it says, proof enough in which it says these things, that an individual could not be judged, right, unless it was two witnesses. And then they had to at least allow a defense, and they didn't allow that. And so in Leviticus 21.10, when the high priest tore his clothes, he sinned against God right there. According to Leviticus 21.10, the high priest was unable to tear his clothes in a kind of spectacle of what he thought about the matter. It would be equivalent of a judge who is doing a trial, right, that has uh, witnesses on the side, the, uh, the jury, and all of these things are going on, and the witnesses are coming up, boom, 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 and then now the defense comes up, and let's say he was you know, giving a witness of himself. I wasn't there or I didn't do it, right? Or he says something and all of a sudden the judge stands up and he rips his robe off. Enough of this. You guys already heard him. He's guilty. What do you guys think? And everybody in the courtroom is like, what in the world are you doing? Dude, you're not even, they didn't do a bench trial. There's a jury there. You have no right to even interfere with this trial other than keeping peace. He had no right to do this, but instead he broke the laws of God and even the laws of his Jewish culture and tore his clothes as in a sense of already making the verdict. He's guilty. And then he puts it on the people. Well, what do you think? You see, that is the problem with a false witness, a contradicting witness, and a distant witness. That just like these high priests getting up and tearing his clothes, we, through our lives, carry the clothes of hypocrisy. We carry the clothes of disobedience. We carry the clothes that we call Christ Jesus and which he commanded to put on ourselves. And instead, we carry an opposite kind of clothing. And we say, guys, look at me. Let me be your witness of who Jesus is and how we ought to be. And if it's not a true and faithful witness, it would only be a witness that would say Jesus is wrong and the way I'm doing it is right. We must be careful of what kind of witness we are. He stands up and asks to declare, we have proof enough. We don't need any more witnesses. While they accuse Jesus of blasphemy, look at what begins to happen. They grab him. And at this point, they all condemned Jesus as worthy of death, and they began to spit at him. They blindfolded our Savior and the Son of God. They began to punch him in the face, rip his beard out. They mocked him. Even the guards, and probably some of the guards that the distant witness was hanging with, they took Jesus and they began to beat him, just as the prophets had declared they would. The Bible says right here in Isaiah 50, verse 60, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and from spitting. We have to understand, as men and women of God in this church, when we go out and witness, that there's a dilemma and a deception out here and a fear of being a true and faithful witness. Where people are afraid because the one thing we see here that correlates with being a true and faithful witness is undoubted persecution. When people will begin to beat you, mock you, disrespect you, and we begin to try to arrest you, spit in your face, curse at you, and all these things that come with being a true and faithful witness of Jesus. 
And the moment Jesus made that declaration and showed to be the true and faithful witness, immediately they began to beat this guy. Immediately they began to come against him, mock him, criticize him. And I believe the reason why people fall under the other three categories of a witness, whether it be a distant, contradicting, or a false witness, is because we know the moment we stand on true and faithful witness, people are going to start disregarding me. They're going to start coming against me. They're going to start canceling me. They're going to start mocking me and spitting at me. Try to put me in prison and shut me down and lock me away. My family may come against me. and I get fired from my job. All these other negatives that the world and the enemy has set up against true and faithful witnesses. And so we must understand what Jesus added to this true and faithful witness. That one day I am going to come back on a cloud of heaven to judge the world. And if there's no other reason to remain a true and faithful witness, let that be the reason. That one day we're going to stand before the true and faithful witness who is Jesus Christ. And from that point on, he is going to judge us based upon what kind of witness we were or for that matter, the kind of witness we weren't. And there will be no more excuses. No more, but God, I was going to, you know, they were going to, my, my boyfriend was going to leave me, my, my girlfriend. I, I had to make a decision, God, and Lord, you said you're a God of love, and so I chose them, God. God, you know, man, I got kids at home and they're talking about I got to do X, Y, and Z. And God, I just, I just went with the crowd because I got to put food on my, my kid's table. I got to pay my bills. God, you don't understand. God, like, I got a lot of bills. I can't just give up my job, God. What kind of stuff is that? I'm not insane. I can't just give up my reputation, God got followers. God is asking us, what kind of witness are you of the Lord Jesus Christ? What kind of witness? Thank God for Jesus, who he gave us the example of these things. And if we truly believe, as the word of God says, he sits at the right hand of the Father today. And he says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He said, I go away to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you also may be. If that's not true, I would have never said it, he said. And he's given us so many reasons and so many things and promises to hold on to when we face these kind of persecutions and fear. When we face a world, a hostage world, a hostile world, that we're able to remember my Savior did this for me. Because right after this, we see they condemned him guilty. And they let him straight away to be sentenced now by the government, the world, to be crucified. He didn't, did it, he didn't do it for himself. He did it for you and I. It is the reason why he did it. Revelation 1, 5 on down, it says this, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, hallelujah. If he rose, will we not rise with him? And the ruler of the king of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sin by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom and a priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. The Bible calls Jesus the true and faithful witness. The firstborn from the dead. He knows where we're going to be going through, but he gives us the confidence and the hope that if I resurrected from the dead, will I not resurrect you from the dead? So why would you hold on to your life only to lose your soul? The reality is we all have been at a time and even some now the distant witness. Can I get an amen? We all have been at a time where we try to think highly of ourselves but yet we fall, we fail only pray to be a contradicting witness. All of us at a time even became a false witness, whether knowingly or unknowingly. But it is Jesus who is the true and faithful witness, whose desire is to make us true and faithful witnesses of himself. It was Jesus who stood his ground for us. 
It was Jesus who declared amid false witnesses the true and faithful witness of who he is and come to do as Messiah and who he is and what he will do as God and judge of those who refuse to believe in him when he returns. He endured the beatings. He endured the spitting. He endured the mockery. He even endured death on the cross in which he shed his own blood that we may all have forgiveness of our sin and the opportunity to be saved, to become the true and faithful witnesses of the Lord until his coming. Today we must answer the question as we've been talking about in these last three weeks. What kind of witness are we? What kind of witness do we want to be? The encouragement I have today in light of this is to repent unto the Lord of being anything other than a true and faithful witness of the Lord in both word and deed and action. To continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling to endure to the end as a true and faithful witness of the precious and mighty Savior and Lord, Jesus the Christ and Son of the living God. Amen.